Good morning. Whenever I see Brandon do something, I, for some reason, I get a picture into my mind of someday, someday seeing Andrew do the same thing. Do, do you do that? Andrew's such a little miniature uh, version of, of him. I just think of him, I think of Andrew doing that someday and uh, what he'll be like when he leads singing or what he'll be like when he teaches a class. And uh, so fun to watch uh, our kids grow and not just our kids, uh, to watch uh, God's people grow. And uh, I love watching that as uh, I look around and as I see the growth that's taking place in your life and in my life and uh, give thanks for how God does that. I want to ask you to turn to Psalm 15 this morning, please. Psalm 15. I don't think I've preached a lesson from the Psalms here. And so this will be a first. But uh, I love to preach uh, from the Psalms because there's so many, obviously, like with any portion of the Word of God, so many um, practical, so many perspective things that can be learned from a great book that was Israel's songbook. It was Jesus' songbook, really. It was the songbook that he and his disciples used. And so it teaches us some great things uh, that are not only practical with regard to worship, but practical with regard uh, to living. And, and this particular psalm is a psalm that is a living psalm. Uh, it's not a psalm that is, um, that's focused on some thanksgiving or some praise that's being offered to God. But it is, a, it is like um, our, one of our, some of our songs where the point of it is to admonish. It's, it's a teaching and admonishing psalm. And so the psalmist asks a question in the opening verses that he then answers in the following verses. He asks a question about who, who's the person that lives in God's tent? And who's the person that dwells on God's hill? That's a great question, isn't it? I mean, what does God, if I'm going to live in God's tent, if he's going to tent with me and if I'm going to tent with him, then, then what kind of person does he want me to be? And if I'm going to dwell on the hill where God lives, if I'm going to live on Zion, then, then who's the person that has a right to do that? And then in the following verses, he describes the quality of the heart, the type of person who lives with God. And so let's, let's read together the psalm, and then let's talk together about the practical things that the psalmist, and this is a psalm of David, that David tells us, are the virtues of the person who lives in God's tent and who lives on God's hill. O Lord, who may abide in thy tent? Who may dwell on thy holy hill? Here's the answer. He who walks with integrity and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. He who does not slander with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend. In whose eyes a reprobate is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord. He who, he who swears to his own hurt and does not change. He who does not put out his money at interest, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be shaken. And so he's described for us in a very concise form the virtues of the man who lives in God's tent and the man who dwells on God's hill. And I want us to look at these virtues together um, and to take, let these be our takeaway this week for how we live our days for how we conduct ourselves and our relationships with each other and our relationship through the week. There's lots of preaching in this psalm about what are the makings of a virtuous life. So who is it that lives in God's tent? And who is it that dwells on God's hill? First of all, he tells us, it's the person that walks upright. It's the person who walks upright. If I could take that statement and make it into an imperative, I want to say this to you. Don't slouch. Don't slouch. 
we are the children of God. Walk like it. We are the sons and the daughters of the Almighty. So don't slouch. Stand up straight. Stand up tall. And when I, don't say, when I say don't slouch, I'm not talking about your physical posture. I'm talking about your moral posture. We are the children of God. And so the children of God walk like the Father does. He doesn't slouch. He doesn't, he, he, he's, doesn't, he's not bowed morally. He walks upright. And so we walk upright because that's the way that the Father walks. When I say don't slouch, I mean don't even lean. Don't even lean the way the world does. Walk upright today. Walk upright this week. Stand tall. Because the person who fears the Lord, the man who does what's right in the eyes of God, he has no reason to be ashamed. He has every reason to walk tall, to stand tall, and to walk straight ahead. I love when Paul, in his epistle to the Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 6, when he describes the armor that is worn by the soldier of the cross, by the child of God, he talks about our breastplate as being a breastplate of righteousness. And I want you to think about, it ties in with what the psalmist says here about, about walking uprightly and about walking straight ahead. It, it ties in with that, with a concept uh, that, that's, that's communicated by the idea of righteousness being our breastplate. Do, do, do you see that, that we, when we are clad with righteousness... When, when that's the thing that we wear is the covering over our vital organs, there's nothing to be afraid of. There is not any kind of weapon that can penetrate someone who is clad with righteousness. And the reason why is because we have clad ourselves with the same cloak that God wears. God is righteous. And so He marches straight ahead. And His will gets accomplished because righteousness doesn't stop for anyone. Righteousness doesn't stop for anything. Righteousness cannot be penetrated. It cannot be conquered. Now, I know that righteous people, just people, suffer. I know that they hurt. But in the end, righteousness will always win. Justness will always prevail. And so that's the reason why we're clad with righteousness is because it equips us as a people to do precisely that, to walk straight ahead into battle, to walk straight ahead into whatever the conflict is, and to not be afraid because, as we just sang, the battle belongs to the Lord and righteousness will always prevail. Amen. So don't slouch is the first thing that he tells us. The people that live in God's tent... The people that live on God's hill, they don't slouch. They walk upright. Because when we walk upright, there's nothing to fear. Number two, he says to us uh, in verse, the second part of verse 2, speak, he speaks truth in his heart. The man who lives with God speaks the truth in his heart. So, as a practical admonition this week, tell the truth. Speak the truth. Speak the truth in your home. Tell the truth on the job. Speak the truth on the playground. Tell the truth at school. Speak the truth. The people that live with God don't lie. The people that dwell on God's hill, they are not dishonest. God always is faithful to His Word. God always tells the truth. And so those that are the children of God are truth-tellers too. We speak the truth. And it begins with us telling the truth, loving the truth, speaking the truth in our heart. You know, we start reasoning within ourselves when we find ourselves in a pinch that's uncomfortable or that's awkward, or when there is the opportunity maybe to make more if we bend the truth, 
or to get your way because you manipulate circumstances? When, when we start to reason that way, that all starts inside, does it not? It doesn't start, doesn't start here on my tongue. It starts down here in my heart. And so I need, to, I need to be a person who loves the truth inside me. And I need to, when I find myself craving, having an appetite for bending the truth in order to manipulate a person or in order to, to manipulate the circumstances or in order to escape the consequences of something that I've, that I've already done that I need to now repent of, when, when I start bending the truth, when I start telling, I, I need to rebuke that in my heart. That's where, I need, that's where I need to stop it, is I need to stop the lie inside. It ain't right. It's not becoming those that live with God. And so the second admonition is, we need to be honest. Tell the truth, speak the truth in your heart. Number three, what is a God-dweller? What is a person who live with, with God? What does he behave like? Well, he says in verse 3, He does not slander with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor. He does not take up reproach against his friend. A third admonition that I want to suggest to us is that we don't backbite. Don't run people down. You know, one of the most humiliating things that you can do to your spouse is to say things that are unbecoming about them in front of others. Don't ever do that. Don't run your spouse down in front of other people. That's humiliating. It shows great disrespect. It hurts them. And it hurts their reputation. And, and, and don't just reserve that for... I mean, don't, don't just not do that with your spouse. Don't do that with your children. That's, that's humiliating when you talk about expose, lay open their, their lives and their hearts in front of others. That's, that, that can be humiliating. Don't, don't do that about your friends. Don't do that about one another. Don't do it about your boss. Don't get involved in water cooler kind of conversations where you're running down the leadership. You see, the, 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 the God dweller, the person that lives in God's tent and that dwells on God's hill, that, that is not, that's not his practice. That's not the way we talk at our table, at God's table. That's not the way His people talk. And so instead of running down, folks, let, let's change our language. Why not make it the habit tomorrow and today and this week? Why not make it our habit to build somebody or somebody's up today? Now, is that not going to make a better world if I make that my practice rather than making everybody a, a moving target for me? For my sarcasm or for my wit at other people's expense? And so make it your habit to be a builder-upper, not someone who's involved in tearing people down. Encourage, don't discourage. D don't gossip, don't listen to gossip. Choose your words wisely. Choose your words carefully. Calculate your words so that they are seasoned with grace and that they edify hearers rather than doing the opposite. Because those that live with God just don't do that. He says, verse 4, in whose eyes a reprobate is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord. Those that live with God, those that walk with God, they despise vileness. They despise vileness. Um, you know, you, uh, the media does not work in our favor in terms of how it um, affects our mood and our attitudes about our world. Because uh, it can, uh, and, and I hate how that affects, how that affects our culture. Because uh, the topics of people's conversation throughout the day tend to be whatever was the news of the day. So we talk about what was on the morning news or what was on the evening news. People just, our conversations end up being dictated by whatever the media makes the topic of conversation for the day. That's, there, there, there's, there's something not good about that. Um, and not only does the news of the day become the topics of today's conversation because, and, and, and so... 
de- you know, deprive us of, of having enriching conversation and, and edifying kind of speech, but it also dictates our moods as a result. And so we end up, we end up ending up becoming affected by all the stuff that we're watching and listening to and all the stuff that shows up on today's, you know, the, the front page of Yahoo or whatever. Uh, listen, we who dwell with God despise vileness. We don't, we don't give in to it. We don't consent to it. We don't say that this is, this is just the way the world is. And so we just give up or we give in or we just accept that that's the way it is. We don't do that. We don't do that. We are living in Sodom. We are living in a world that is, that is a broken world. We are living, we are living in a culture that, 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 that doesn't see what we know to be true about God, but we don't, we don't give in to that. We despise the fact that the world has turned its back on God, and we, we go forward with our light and we shine it, and we are, not, we are not deterred by evil. We don't consent to it. We don't give in to it. We're not party to it. And we don't allow that to dampen our speech. We don't allow it to dampen our view, to darken our view. Despise vileness. Don't give consent to evil. Don't be silent when you need to speak up. When it's wrong... And when you know it's wrong, and you need to be the voice of reason, and you need to be the voice of virtue, then speak up. Don't laugh when you need to censure. If it's not appropriate, if it shouldn't be said, if it's not really, if it's not really funny in a virtuous way, then speak up. Say something. If it's something that folks ought to blush at and people aren't blushing, people aren't embarrassed, then be the one that blushes. Be the one that, 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 that even stutters and says, this, is, this isn't something we should be talking about. This isn't something that we should be thinking about. This isn't a place where we should be. This is not good. Despise vileness, he says. Stand up for what's right and for who's right. Because in the eyes of those that dwell with God, a reprobate is despised, and those who honor, uh, they honor those who fear God. He says those that live with God, those that dwell in his tent, are those that swear to their own hurt, and they do not change. What, what is that saying? He that swears to his own hurt. He's painting a picture here of someone who makes a commitment and they intended to keep the commitment, and then their circumstance changed. And now it's not so, you know, something's come up. And so now it's not so convenient to keep the commitment. Now it's not so convenient to honor the promise or the pledge that was made. And so that's the reason why he swears to his own hurt, is he says he was going to do something, and he does it, even though it cost him more than he thought it was going to cost him. And so the, the point that he's making here in the text is that we do what we say we're going to do. Now, how would that bless your relationships if you always did what you said you were going to do? And how good, how healthy would your relationships be with others if everyone that was on your team, everyone that was in your family, everyone that was in your neighborhood... Everyone that was in government, what if everyone did what they said they were going to do? Wouldn't that be something? Well, let it start with you. Just when you say you're going to do something, then just then do it. If you make a commitment to your wife that you're going to do something, if you make a commitment to your husband that you're going to do, then, then just then do the thing that you say you're going to do. Uh, Jennifer, uh, I think it was the first of last year, said um, to me, I, you know, I, I, I come up with ideas of something that would be good to do, and then I, it's just an idea. I don't do it. And so she made a commitment last year that when she thought of something good to do and she said something about it, that she was going to do it. And you know what? She did it, <laughs> which means that it's doable. You can say, I'm going to do something. 
I'm gonna, this, is a, this is something that's a good idea. It would help someone else. It would be a blessing to someone. And so and I'm not just going to say it. I'm going to go and practice it. And it, it was a great growth thing. It convicted me so much that I remember it a year and a half later. That, that, and then the difference that it's made. And so be a person that when you say you're going to do something, do it. Does God do that? Does God make promises to his own hurt? He promised Abraham that he would bless his seed. You know what it cost him? It cost him his son is what it cost him. And he made it a promise that didn't depend on Abraham. It didn't depend on Isaac. It didn't depend on Jacob. It didn't depend on any of his descendants. In fact, if it had depended on us, it wouldn't have been accomplished. But God promised with an oath. He swore that he would do it. He put his own reputation on the line that he would do it. And God kept his promise, even though it hurt him. And so he wants us to be that kind of people, that we say we're going to do things, we do the things that we say we're going to do, and we show the same kind of faithfulness that God himself modeled and showed us, even to his own hurt. Be a person of your word. He says in verse 5, that the virtuous person does not put out his money at interest, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. Now, he's talking about loan sharking here. He's talking about, I give John Dean a loan at 30%. Uh, He's talking about using money in a way to put people, oblige people to us in some way. And, And... we can do that not just with money. We can do that sort of thing with, our, with anything that's a strength of ours or anything that's a gift of ours. We can use our gifts and our strengths, our resources, in order to put people uh, in, a, in a weak position, in order to take advantage of other people. And, and we've got to watch that abuse of our power, that abuse of our money, that abuse of our position, that use of our rights or our virtues or our power over people in some way. Those that, are, those that are the people of God, those that live on His hill, those that dwell with Him, are not people who take advantage of the innocent. Uh, I, I, I took a job um, right out of college, and Jen and I had just married. I had a lot of sorry sort of... Uh, uh, difficult kinds of, uh, of, uh, of work when we first got, like so many folks, that, um, that were, not, we were not so exciting from the standpoint of um, just some of the challenging positions. One was for a company that rented furniture. And uh, the first day on the job, we were going to people's homes and we were taking away their big screen TVs and their uh, and their refrigerators and, um, and, 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 and their appliances. Because what basically what it ended up being was a, a rental of things of, to people that they couldn't afford to buy. And so they were renting it on a weekly basis. And, uh, and so a big part of that was doing collections. Uh, it, the whole thing made me so sick at the end of the day that I told them I can't, I can't come back tomorrow. I need, to, I need to find something else to do because I can't, I can't be in a business where the business is built on uh, preying on people who, uh, uh, who, 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 are, who, who can't afford things that, that we're renting to them uh, and, and making, making money off of them. That, this, that just didn't sit right. And I, I, I say all that to say that we need, to be, we need to be thoughtful about how we behave with people and about how we use our gifts and how we use our resources and how we use our strengths. Spend wisely. Use your time, your talents, your money as if you were borrowing them yourself because we are, are we not? 
the things that we have, they are gifts from God. And so don't use them in order to manipulate or to use other people. Use the gifts that God has given you in order to be a blessing to other people. That's the way we use our gifts and our strength, our money and our position. Make him a prophet in the way that you behave and in the way that you interact with people. And so that is a virtue of the person who lives in God's hill and who dwells in God's tent. Look at what he says at the end. He who does these things. He who does what things? He who walks uprightly, who doesn't slouch. He who speaks the truth, who's honest in his speech. He who doesn't backbite, who builds up, who doesn't tear down. He who despises vileness but stands up for the righteous. He who swears to his own hurt and doesn't change. He who spends wisely. He who does all of these things will never be shaken. He won't be shaken. He will never be shaken. That's a promise. And you know what? Because God keeps his, tells the truth, God keeps his promises and so when he says that those who, those who do these things will not be shaken, it is so. They will not be shaken. So could I offer that to you as our marching orders for the week? We are God dwellers. We live with him. We dwell on his hill. We live in his tent. Walk this way. Walk this way. Live this way. Because that's the way that we honor him. That's the way that we magnify him. That's the way that we can surely make a difference in his world. Several years ago, um, I can't remember how many now, seven or so, uh, on a Wednesday night after services, um, I asked a lady named Wanda if we could have a conversation kind of out away from the rest of the people in the group. And... and uh, Wanda, uh, Wanda had been hearing things that I preached and I uh, didn't know what she believed and where she was and I, was, I, I thought she needed to be baptized. And um, so I said to Wanda, Wanda, um, you hear me talk all the time and I've probably said things that you don't agree with and things that maybe have made you angry at times. And, uh, but I don't, I don't know what you think. And so I'd like to, could we get together and could you tell me where you are and what you think? And uh, so the, we made an appointment and the next day she came by the church building. And so we had about a 20 minute conversation and uh, she came with her mind already made up. And she was baptized that afternoon. And um, she said, after it was over, she said, um, let's... Uh, she said, let's not make a big deal about this. Let's not. And I said, Wanda, I'm not going to tell anybody. Um, you, you just tell who you want to tell. Well, by Sunday, everybody knew. <laughs> so Wanda told a few people. But uh, Jim, her husband, had come home that afternoon, and he didn't know one whit about the whole thing. He didn't know about our conversation. He didn't know about the appointment, anything like that. And so when Jim walked in the door... Uh, that afternoon, uh, she said, uh, she said uh, guess what I did today? <laughs> and I don't expect there was anybody happier out of all the people that Wanda told than Jim. Uh, Jim and Wanda are dear friends of mine and Jen's and of Al and Liz, and they're here today. And I love them because they're the kind of people that the psalmist is talking about when he talks about people that live on God's hill and that dwell in God's house. Um, they just, uh, they live their life for him. And Sister Wanda is someone who does that. And you are people that do that. And I love you for that. And I need to be among people like that. And maybe your heart is convicted because there's been something that we've talked about as we've thought about living in God's hill that's... Um, that's burdened you about a change that you need to make in your life. Today's a good day to do that. Today's a great day to do that. And so why not start now?
why not make the change? If it's something that you, need to, you just need to decide in your own heart, then do that. If it's something that, that you need us to be involved in doing and helping with and praying about, then, then let, let's, let's take care of that. If you need to make a decision like Wanda did about having your sins washed away by the blood and the promise of God, about, by the blood of Christ and the promise of God, then, let, then let's do that. Won't you come right now as we stand and as we sing?